I'm Dr. Vanessa Sinclair, and this is Rendering Unconscious. Today I have a group of discussants here to talk about Remix. Joining me are Mark America, David Gunkel, Paul D. Miller, Eduardo Navas, and Aram Sinreich. Links to their websites and to their social media can be found in the text accompanying this episode. Just visit renderingunconscious.org. Rendering Unconscious is also a book. Rendering Unconscious Psychoanalytic Perspectives, Politics, and Poetry, available from Trapar Books. Visit our publisher's website, trapar.net. That's T R A P A R T dot net. You may support the podcast at our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Vanessa 23 Carl. Thank you so much for your support. It is greatly appreciated. As with all Rendering Unconscious podcast episodes, there is a video of this discussion up at YouTube. Just find Trapar Film's YouTube channel, Trapar Film at YouTube. All right. Well, as I was saying, it's my dream to have you all in the same discussion. So thank you all for being here. The remix here. crew. Does anyone have anywhere specific they want to jump in? Yeah, you would have a term for this because you're you're into uh, psychoanalysis and other things. Um, so, <laughs> so, so what do you call it when someone asks you a question? I wanted to ask you, <laughs> you a question to get things going. If that's okay, Vanessa, can you right. can you talk just about the name of the podcast and how you ended up coming up with that name? I I think it's really interesting. Oh, thank you. No one's ever asked me that. Um, it, rendering unconscious actually it was a poetry night that I used to do in New York where I would do like free associative kind of cut up poetry and I called that rendering unconscious I don't know I think it might have come out of one of my cut up poems um, and so it was a poetry night and then when I started a podcast I was like that seems like a good name for a psychoanalytic podcast as well so it kind of fits the whole free associative cut up theme but yeah it has a lot of different kind of nuances and ways that you could look at it. What do you think of it, Mark? What does it bring to I, mind? I, I think it relates to uh, to remix, actually. So it kind of, you know, it, it uh, you know, if, if in fact remix is the every only methodology that's embodied in, uh, in praxis, then, uh, then that's kind of like rendering, uh, yeah, rendering the unconscious. The unconscious. Yeah. You know, I mean, it points to remix as an unconscious creative act. You know, that can be exhilarating if you really are like in the moment, which so many of the folks here know exactly what I'm talking about. Of course, there's also the uh, the physical metaphor, right? Rendering is melting something down into its component elements, and then reusing those elements to to do something. You know, like the way that animal fat is rendered in order to create, uh, you know, chicken feed and, and other kinds of products. So in a way, you know, if you want to take the metaphor to its, uh, to its extreme, it really uh, works in the context of remix because cultural uh, expressions are being reduced to their kind of subcomponent elements and then repurposed for other uh, signification. Well, yeah, I mean, let's let me unpack that from my perspective, which is I think um, I have this theory right now that I feel like language is the most powerful tool human beings have ever made. And the issue right now is that obviously we're in a data driven society. And so the way that language overlaps with the sort of unconscious sense of that, how math informs almost every algorithmic um, engagement that we're dealing with, whether it's this Zoom session or a phone call or you're listening to a rendered file. The funny thing is language, you know, phonemes, constants, et cetera, we're always thinking about how language can evolve, but so too with code. So um, the remix is just kind of more of an indigenous ter interpretation. I want to say indigenous meaning digital native. Um, and the way that digital native works versus other, you know, demographics 
kids have grown up, uh, wars are happening, you name it. The eerie thing is, it's like how much we now accept that everything is in multiplicity and we're in the era of the unfinished work. Um, everything can always be transformed, changed, updated. And that kind of slippery slope, including whether you're, you know, Vladimir Putin or Zelensky in Ukraine, or for that matter, you know, uh, Lady Gaga or whatever. I mean, the funny thing is, is like how much that notion of the unstable subject has come uh, to the center of digital culture right now. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking about this and um, there's a lot in collage practices, which is about sort of rendering unconsciousness by making it manifest, right? Um, when I started my career, I began working with an architect named Ben Nicholson, who his design practice was to collage his architectural designs. And in the process to extract out of the material of the collage, a architectural rendering that could then be built and it was an entirely different way of doing the creative process because it, it called on that long tradition of the collage practice as being able to access something that is not directly uh, conscious in the, in the creator or in the artist. You know, and David, just to riff on that too, and this is something that both Mark and Aaron were mentioning, is like everyone right now seems to be really gravitating towards this theory of the multiverse. Uh, whether you're, you know, Marvel Comics with Doctor Strange or Sun Ra's notion of um, sort of the, the infinite malleability of space time and jazz noise. Um, then on the other end of the spectrum, you have, there's a really good movie. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Everything, everywhere, all at once. I cannot um, wait to see it. It's brilliant. <laughs> but the multiverse and the remix kind of have an overlap because each one, and same with collage, David. I mean, I think each collage is this idea of potentiality in the fragment. And the multiverse, uh, amusingly enough, science is catching up to these kind of more intuitive relationships of quantum entanglement, uh, what Einstein would call spooky action at a distance. Then there's other weird gaps in the general theory of relativity that eerily enough, uh, Einstein, one of my favorite phrases, was he's like, he said uh, he was having a dispute with another really renowned quantum uh, guy. Um, and they were. Einstein was like, look, I'd like to think that the moon still is there when I look away from it. Like meaning our human perception engages with the physical world, uh, whether you're Schrodinger or Heisenberg, you know, Heisenberg's uh, theory of uh, the, the kind of the uncertainty principle. But the remix still engages with this idea of multiplicity at every level. And so we're just hearing one stream of a reality in sound or in literature. Uh, and that's where this multiverse thing kind of overlaps with remix. Because right? you would say that every multiverse is a remix of a narrative theme or path or time stream, you know, time frame. All right. So, so this ties into something I've been thinking a lot about recently. And, and as usual, uh, it's, I think it's time for us to check in because we, this is a conversation that needs to happen. So, okay. So... Um, the multiverse is one of these tropes that is that's ascendant right now in all these narratives. But there, there are two others too that I think are directly related to this conversation. One is the simulation hypothesis. So I've read two books in the last month uh, or two months that are that uh, where the simulation theory is is at the central the center of the narrative. One is um, the anomaly, which is a, a French novel uh, that was written and, and published during COVID. It was a French bestseller that was recently translated into, into English. I forget the author's name. And then the other one is the new Emily Sanchon Mandel book, which is called Sea of Tranquility. Uh, she's the one that wrote, wrote Station Eleven, the, the kind of uh, pandemic novel that got turned into a show by HBO this year. Um, <clears throat> and then I just read the new Kazuo Ishiguro book, uh, Clara and the Sun, which is about a sentient AI uh, who is essentially a slave, um, and, but is self-aware and, uh, and doesn't actively resist her kind of status as an enslaved conscious entity. Um, but what that book raises is, is this kind of third tangential que uh, question or scenario that I think plays directly into the multiverse and the, uh, the, um, the uh, simulation kind of narratives that, that uh, we we're just talking about, which is this question of whether a simulated person in AI consciousness uh, is a copy of or is somehow subordinate to uh, an organic 
consciousness such as ourselves. So what I propose, and this is something that I started laying out to Eduardo in an email a couple of years ago, and we were talking about maybe building it into something and we haven't, but it's been sitting there in the back of my mind, tugging at my neurons since then. It's just that all three of those different kind of tropes ladder up to the same fundamental question, which is the question of primacy, which is why do we have an ontology that says that when two things are similar to one another, uh, one of them must be prior to and superior to, and therefore more authentic, more valuable, um, more authoritative than the other one. And part of what I would like to introduce into this conversation, and this is, this is, a, this is a premise that I've been meaning to write down for several years, but now I think I have to do it in the context of these narratives that, that I was just talking about, is this notion that primacy is a red herring. Once you do away with an ontology that requires one object or entity uh, to have primacy over another in some kind of hierarchical relational system, all kinds of questions become irrelevant. The question of whether we're living in a simulation or not becomes irrelevant. The question of whether machine consciousness is authentic uh, relative to organic consciousness is irrelevant. The question of whether we're living in the right version of the multiverse or not is irrelevant, right? Because imminent, the imminent experience of occupying a subjectivity becomes um, independent from the question of whether it's dependent on or subordinate to another uh, set of circumstances. And I think, I think remix theory is the, is the way that I got to that point, understanding that, that what's really at stake when we talk about remix and legitimacy is the question of primacy. It's really, uh, you know, I, 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 I remember uh, we exchanged emails, and I think we even exchanged some abstracts or something, and we just got lost by the wayside on it. And, uh, you know, we got a of things, but I'm happy that you brought this back. But I remember when we discussed this, you didn't have this concept of primacy yet, because some of these other variables you mentioned were not there. Um, but yeah, and uh, I think simulation is really interesting because I just saw, I didn't just see it, but I saw the last matrix and, and I, you know, I was sort of disappointed in, in many aspects of it. And it, it could have been different, I think, but, uh, but it seems to recur, right? You know, uh, uh, and I think this uh, concept of primacy is something I hadn't really thought about, but, you know, in terms of, you know, I, I, I did, I had a chapter in simulation in, in something I'm working on now, and, and uh, it's not even close to what you're saying, so it's completely different. And, you know, I'm not going to change anything. It's done, pretty much. It's, I have to submit it. But, uh, and I wouldn't take that, you know, because I didn't even take anything from our exchange of set of respect, you know, too. And, uh, uh, but yeah, I think it's uh, an amazing uh, proposition. Uh, it reminds me of uh, the theories of complexity and emergence, right, that are out there. And, and uh, you know, which kind of tap at that. Uh, you know, I've read a bit about it uh, for my own research, and but I don't think that nobody ever has touched on it uh, as you just presented it. It also reminds me of how the focus on post-humanism or the Anthropocene, for example, uh, are both uh, ultimately, they're not post-human, you know, they're, they're still human-centered. Like we're still, the only reason why we care about post-humanism is because we realize we're gonna like, not be here if we're something about it, right? So it's about our own survival. So, but but the proposition you're making just now, it's completely uh, kind of flipping that in a, in a way that I didn't quite think about it before. So anyway, so I just wanna, uh, I just kind of like say, I'm very um, uh, intrigued by what you just said. You know, it's just like- I still would love to write it with you, man. Again, it's yeah, it's great to, yeah, It's great that you brought it here because I, it just, you know, we, we lost track of it. And uh, uh, I think we all have multiple things going and, and uh, you know, we're spread thin, right? Which is a good thing because, uh, you know, obviously it's because we all have, we believe in the ideas we're doing and, uh, and so forth. And, uh, but yeah, I'm really excited to see what others think. So I just had to throw in my two cents of, you know, remembering uh, that, that time stuff, so, yeah. So Eduardo has, Eduardo has, has yeah, two cents. Hey, and I have one. one. Sorry, <laughs> I'm talking over somebody. I, just one word, Platonism. Yeah, this, this, is the, this is the struggle against Platonism. A hundred percent, a hundred percent, right? Dualism as this like completely um, unempirically required 
perspective has been like dogging human thought, especially in the West for 2000 years. And it's, it's time to kill it. Of course, if, if uh, <clears throat> you know, Spinoza couldn't do it, I don't know if we can, but. <laughs> or Nietzsche for that matter. Yeah. You know, actually, you guys, I have, you guys just made me remember a couple of different things. One, the philosophy of the multiverse. Um, amusingly enough, um, people tend to forget that Leibniz had a big dispute with Newton and Newtonian physics obviously gave way to how we think about you know, Einstein's general theory of relativity and so on. But amusingly enough, uh, the, the term multiverse was coined by um, the American philosopher William James. And the funny thing about multiplicity, and again, remixing means you've distilled down from a, when you, Aaron, when you were just talking about primacy, like think about the original version of something like, or I don't know, for example, I don't know, Parliament Funkadelic or James Brown. If I take that, remix it, mash it up, you've already created a multiple sonic memory, and you've also played with how people perceive that memory. And so perception in sound and art and so on, including uh, market forces are also driven by perception. And then on top of that, the way physics operates, again, in this sort of Schrodinger kind of approach here, when we observe something, we transform it and we engage with it. Uh, our perceptual architecture, our cognitive architecture, all of these things, like a lot of scientists are now saying time doesn't exist, which I've been really intrigued with. Like the whole, there's a whole movement right now to kind of read. Uh, there's actually a really good album years and years ago. I'm sure you guys remember. Um, it was called The New Refutation of Space and Time, which is a classic early hip hop album. But um, I, I chuckle about this because we're, we're at this moment where technology, and again, Aram and David, you guys were just riffing on, the simulation theory, multiverse theory, I think if we were to look for the common denominator there, it's still anthropocentric. Um, and Eduardo, some of the issues that you were thinking about is like how we perceive things and how we subjectively engage them. I mean, amusing enough, the remix culture that we mostly refer to is out of music. Uh, of course, now video mashups, everything mashups. But the African-American culture uh, is, to me at least, an implicit DNA foundation of this, all puns intended, come to think of it. But when you look at the idea of identity, uh, African-Americans were considered uh, two-thirds of a human being uh, for tax purposes. It's in the Constitution. And the construction of a humanist narrative still comes out of that enlightenment. And then the sort of, when I say the enlightenment, obviously the French overlap with the American revolutions. And so when you have these revolutions going on, a lot of people were trying to figure out our relationship to the state um, and democracy, which I personally think we're, we're in a crisis of democracy, mainly because of social media. Um, all of these things are really about subjectivity and how subjectivity can be in and exist in multiplicity, which again, the multiverse and simulation theories overlap with that. I'm just kind of riffing here, but um, if you look at William James, he, he's literally considered generally the, the, the person who coined the term multiverse. But there's other earlier examples like Leibniz's moda, moda, monadology, where they, they have like layers and layers of, of space time. And when he was working on the general theory of calculus, uh, he felt uh, that there was multiple layers of reality and you know this kind of thing. But there's also Indian mythology about simulation, uh, which is called samsara, um, and so on and so on. There's, I love this idea, especially in myth, because um, you wake up one morning, you're in a different, there's a great a talking head song. This is not your wife. This is not your house, you know, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. So just riff in there. And you ask yourself, how did I get here? Yeah, that's what the song says, right? <laughs> and I, I do think uh, for me, sometimes I, uh, you know, one of the interesting things that I, I, I in terms of what, what you were saying, Paul, one of the things that uh, I do feel uh, sometimes I, you know, I go back to stuff that I uh, wrote to revise some argument and I realize, did I write this? <laughs> you know, I, was like, I feel like a filter, like who wrote this thing? You know, I, I honestly do. And, and uh, you know, I, I, and Mark was uh, uh, on Twitter the other day talking about similar things of how, you know, when writing takes over you, right? You, uh, you feel it, you know, you, you, you had a, you, you're explaining you had a unique position because when you start writing, you just, it just kind of comes out. And I think we all feel that in different ways. I also shared my, my experience about that. Like sometimes I will make statements that I, I just didn't even have when I made an outline for, for an argument, you know? And it's kind of like, well, how did, where, where did that come from, right? And you realize it's all these things you read maybe even five, six, seven years ago uh, about render unconscious. I guess that's what that's about. But I, I don't know if you want to talk about it a little bit, Mark, because uh, I, I think it's... Uh, uh, you know, I mean, 
talking heads are amazing, right? That song is amazing because he kind of talks about that too, you know? So it's funny that, that Paul brought that up. But. Yeah, so, so you ask, how, how did I get here? But yeah, also the question that you're, I think, bringing up, which is something that all creative practitioners have to deal with one time or another, which is, you know, where does it come from? And that's something that we keep going back and forth on in our own little uh, Twitter sphere, Eduardo, you and I. Uh, and, and when you ask that question, I think it does bring up uh, the issues of authenticity and you could even bring in the multiverse of so the idea of uh, a versioning, if you will, uh, a fictional moment that you're capturing in what feels like time, but is really more like timeless time. And so uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm gonna plug my book here because it's just coming out, my life as an artificial creative intelligence. One of the things that I'm, uh, I even have a copy here. I thought I'd let you see it just for a second. Uh, one of the uh, one of the things that I, I was dealing with in, in the book, of course, was this idea of co-authoring or uh, meta jamming in a remix style with uh, an AI language model. And so the question then became, as I engaged with this collaborative remix process with this AI other, what not not how can I train it to perform more like me, but what does it teach me about my own creative processes, my own, and to use the surrealist term, my own psychic automatism, or, you know, Paul was mentioning uh, James as the one who first came up with the, uh, was it the term, the multiverse? Uh, you know, he also came up with stream of consciousness, and so the role that stream of consciousness and improvisation plays in, in you know, when I remember, uh, so I have a story that I tell in the book, about uh, appearing on stage it was a great experience with Don Cherry uh, at, on this at the uh, Central Park Pavilion uh, in 1986. It goes all the way back there, and it was a live uh, NPR broadcast. And and my experiences with him, and then recently, even just earlier, excuse me, uh, in the fall of last year, with his whole family, with with Dave Dave Cherry and Eagle Eye and uh, Nana Cherry as well, and getting a conversation with them. One of the theories that he came up with uh, was this idea of, spon talking about Don now, spontaneous control. You know, he kind of shied away from the term avant-garde and was really kind of interested in uh, just kind of letting it all go. But then there was, this, there was this element of control. So this element of control, I would say, is really kind of uh, tweaking the, the parameters of your experiential filters as you sort of automate your, you know, right, right, which is kind of like, a, it's like an embodied practice. So you, you actually have to, and this is where the AI language comes in, you have to train yourself, right, to uh, automate this remix logical performance that you're, you know, constantly engaging in as you version whatever, you know, moment in time you happen to be fictionalizing or, or embodying at that moment in time, which is this is what I'm getting at with the multiverse too. And so how that informs you and how you inform it and that give and take. So I was learning a lot about this just by, again, meta jamming with the, the AI language model, which is even like, a you know, not even GPT-3, it was GPT-2. And what it was feeding me was a lot of insights into how that, how that process uh, works on, you know, as a creative artist uh, in my own practice, how, how it's kind of embedded in a way. Uh, the the uh, was it Derrida who who spoke of the uh, the prosthesis I I am you know how that I'm, I'm so glad that you that you brought up Don Cherry uh, like he's such an exemplar of of exactly what you're talking about uh, I was I was just listening to his multiculti record which came out in I don't know 1990 uh, a few weeks ago and the whole album is just him drawing on existing musical traditions from, uh, from the Afro di uh, diaspora to essentially set up like established trance states and then to find his um, authentic voice in the moment within the context of those kind of little bubbles of, of, uh, of consciousness set up within these, these right sonically entrained trance states. Uh, and you have to go into it to your point with this like with this level of fluency and mastery, not only the physicality of making music, but also of the uh, underlying codes so that you can be truly free within this moment of uh, kind of transcendence of, of authorial intent, right? That there, there's yep. a level of authorship that, that precedes and supersedes um, individuated uh, conscious decision-making processes. Yeah, and he tapped into this. He uh, there's a book out that just came out. It's a really beautiful, thick book. I wish I could show it to you. Uh, the Organic Music Society, and it's all 
it's all uh, interviews and uh, uh, raps by him and also people who he played with when he was living in Sweden with his wife, uh, Moki Cherry, who was a really interesting artist. And they, they took over like an abandoned schoolhouse and turned it into a space that they still, that the family still has. And they're thinking of turning into an artist residency. And uh, yeah, it really fed into this, it's sort of like a way of life, actually. They, you know, they, they really turned it into a compound and a way of life and a way of just kind of, uh, you know, getting into those alternative states of mind through these mantra-like forms of, uh, of playability, right? Turning, turning consciousness into a form of, play, of uh, playable media. So I think Andre Brock does a great job of connecting that back to uh, the other dimension of what you were talking about, which is this kind of hedonistic immersion in these systems, in these algorithmic uh, generative systems, right? So I don't know if you guys read his new book that just came out a year or two ago. Uh, it's called like Black Techno Cultures or something like that. I forget the title of the book. But his basic argument is that, um, and the term that we haven't used yet in this conversation, although uh, you kind of uh, side alluded to it, Paul, is double consciousness, right? Is the, the fact that uh, by virtue of, you know, the institution of chattel slavery, like African-Americans have, have always been required to see themselves as both subject and object simultaneously, which is, you know, why W.E.B. Du Bois coined this term double consciousness at the beginning of the 20th century. And the ways in which engagement with algorithm, al algorithmic generative systems is almost uh, optimizes the, uh, the kind of hedonic, the hedonic capabilities of double consciousness. Like it, it allows yourself to play with yourself in plain sight as both subject and object in a way that is pleasurable and in a way that is uh, self-affirming and in a way that is uh, communitarian all at once. Um, and Brock's book is great. I, I wish I could remember exactly the term that he uses. Oh, libidinal economy. Mm -hmm. He talks about how African-Americans <laughs> uh, are this libidinal economy. And I, I love that phrase. I found it incredibly useful. Can I interject one thing? I'm going to have to go. Yeah. Um, this idea that uh, Mark is talking about in terms of engaging with these uh, large language models, I think Remix has a lot to really contribute to this conversation because if you look at the debate as it's stacking up right now, you've got the industry people at OpenAI touting this thing as slightly conscious, right? And then you've got the uh, machine learning people and the data scientists, you know, pushing back and saying, oh, don't give us the hype. It's, you know, it's all hype that you're saying. And I think Remix helps us understand the real contribution of these large language models in terms of what they're able to generate. We're not looking for them to be conscious. We're not looking for them to be just tools. We're looking for them to be collaborative uh, participants that open our way of seeing things to new opportunities. Going back to this idea of the rendering the unconscious, I think the large language model plays a role in making that happen for us. And I think Mark's book is a really good way to sort of see it play out in his interactions with GPT-2, because a lot of really amazing things happen in that sort of confluence of a human artist and the large language model. It's really, it was really, uh an exhilarating moment, you know, matching up the language artist with the language model and seeing how they can could at a certain points in a way turn into each other in really interesting mm -hmm. ways and hybridize other forms of consciousness, third mind consciousness. I was borrowing from Burroughs and Geisen on that. Uh, and one, what you're mentioning now, David, by the way, it reminds me of just like, so there was a pop, there's a pop intellectual who, who I know from way back, he was the editor of Feed, Feed Magazine, his name's Stephen Johnson. And he just came out with an article in the New York Times about GPT-3. And some of the, uh, the info data scientists, social scientists who have issues with uh, AI from, you know, obviously from an AI ethics perspective, really uh, started uh, who he quoted, didn't, they didn't say that, that he quoted them out of context, but that he positioned them as purely skeptics when they're really like standing firm in their beliefs that, as you were suggesting, that uh, that AI cannot ever really achieve consciousness and an AGI, an artificial general intelligence, can never really come to be. But neither side of that, of that discussion is really <laughs> dealing with exactly what you're talking about, which is the creative potential to, you know, to evolve these hybridized 
uh, forms of, I call them meta media mystic entanglement that you can really, you know, you can just tap into if, you, if you're willing to open yourself up to the, uh, to the generative moment. I have to go. It's been lovely talking to all of you. And I hope we can do this again in person very quickly in the near term future. Great. Thanks for being here, David. Bye. Uh, you know, the thing about sharing, I have, uh, uh, I mentioned the concept of sharing in, in the current project that I have. And an example I gave about it is the, the ro robot uh, baller, the one that was uh, shooting from the free throw line and the, the three point line and the, the middle uh, of the mid court. Uh, and during the Olympics in the summer, it's I opened uh, that chapter with that, and uh, uh, and I just explained how you know the philosophy behind it by the it's Toyota uh, Motors, right? The corporation that's you know you know about this, you know, or whatever, that produce you know it, it, for 2020, which is the Olympics, they decided to make sure it, it would shoot 2020 times, and it, it never missed. And so, you know, the argument I'm making is, is how uh, the interesting thing about the engineers behind it is that they see this as a way of uh, enhancing creativity. Uh, but one of the, the, I think, chilling effects for anybody who cannot see the bigger picture is how, it, it, similar to writing, as, as Mark is explaining how these other things, possibilities open up and you realize it's kind of like this process I was mentioning of how you, wonder, was this me doing this? Like you realize there's always this otherness coming through that you're not aware of. Um, it, it, in a way, they, they're kind of moving that aspect of intellectual activity to action, to, you know, now robots will be fairly accurate, 100% accurate, this robot is 100% accurate in shooting the ball. Um, uh, and then once you have, you know, embodiment, which is a big issue in AI, as you know, uh, sort of uh, entering the space of intellectual ability, um, then you start to wonder, you know, what, what is left, right? Because that once you have a robot that can outdo any free throw or, you know, the, the paradigm is different. And so, uh, but the way that they see it, you know, what's interesting for me is that they see it as, a, the engineers see it as a way of expanding creativity of sharing creativity with the uh, potential um, elements that could be available, right, to, to us that we ourselves may create. Um, and so, I, you know, that's that certainly is not um, human-centered, you know? <laughs> so I was a little bit thrown off by that, and so I opened up with that, but but I, I just wanted to share that because I think it's related to, to, to this issue. Like, once you have embodiment, like action, actual action, actual, uh, you know, performance with with uh, physical performance executed uh, with the same you know problem solving ability that you know you would have for certain aspects of writing. You know, where, where do we go there? You know, I think this is the the paradigm that that's that's sort of shaping up there. And I, and I think uh, one of the big um, separations that I noticed uh, in terms of posthumanism that has been argued since uh, Catherine Hales is how, um, uh, you know, we went through this process when structuralism and systematic thinking emerged, right? From Freud and Marx on to Derrida, right? Like this sort of privilege of the intellect over the body, mind over body kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, uh, and she said, you know, we have to evaluate how knowledge, uh, part of it, a lot of it has to do with incorporation, embodiment, right? Like how we gain knowledge through the body itself too. And how that is really a conundrum that's not really explored so clearly in AI, right? She doesn't mention AI in her book from 2000, but certainly that's where, you know, the new discussions are going. But once you have something like this, right, where like what Toyota is doing with Robo Baller, you, you have to wonder what, you know, where the sky's the limit. But does that mean we share as opposed to thinking it's just exceptionally uh, human, you know? I don't know. It's just something to throw out there. You just remind me what you yeah, hey, Eduardo, I, I want to just riff on that for just a second, because that, now I'm glad you brought up the company Toyota. Um, they own one of the, the top, it's called Idoru, I-D-O-R-U, that William Gibson also wrote a novel called Idoru. Uh, it's called Hatsune Miku. It, it just means the voice of the future. And they, it's, a, it's a woman who's a hologram that Toyota owns her, um, her algorithms. And so her voice is a data set that's probably if you play it for any Japanese people, she fills arenas throughout Japan. 
And I remember a while ago, there was a two pack versus Dr. Dre Holigam at Coachella. And it was hilarious to see, you know, they, they've remixed uh, two pack uh, poetry and so on, but the hologram had to match the lyrics. So there, everyone was trying to match. And I was just kind of like thinking of the way uh, both Aaron was just talking about double consciousness, the twisted thing about the West. And this is where, is that even from the very, beginning of robotics there's a very famous uh, uh universal robots and so carol chopek uh was a central european writer um and the idea of robots is comes from a czech term meaning forced labor so amusingly enough um at the beginning of the western sort of industrialization there was always a fear of, of the rise of machines um even if you look at science fiction from the 19th and 20th century so many novels, including stuff like now, of course, obviously Alien, which is just, it's, if you look at the creature from Alien, it looks like a, a Yoruba statue. If you ever see the African mythology around that, or of course, Terminator, or of course, The Matrix. But these are all films that have a kind of a, de a subtle tension with an African-American notion of, of how uh, people look at the body in a very coercive uh, situation where basically consciousness is this sort of um, intangible data set. And when I think about uh, what you're just talking about with Catherine Hales or what Mark was just talking about with AI, the, once human beings etherealize many of the issues that mathematically we're inclined to do, you know, we're looking for better search engine optimization. We're looking for better vocals to, to you know, use auto-tune for or whatever. I mean, it's incredible to see how the human subject becomes more and more etherealized, but we're looking for these sort of reductionist data sets around how to both corporatize that, whether you're an influencer uh, on TikTok, or for that matter, if you're thinking about how social media has, you know, there's a, this term the French have, the voix des incarnés, the, the disembodied voice, which again, Mark goes back to stuff like uh, William S. Burroughs' idea of the third mind and so on. But we're living in that. That's, that's literally the way we live these days. And um, I'm fascinated with how a data-driven society right now is really in the middle of both a crisis of authenticity and a crisis of meaning, but also a crisis of governance and a crisis of how we think about democracy as a, as a tool set for thinking about how we can balance between the individual and the nation state. Um, obviously, there's a lot of articles showing that social media immediately starts tending towards the loudest person in the room. So people, these are all platforms that are engagement engines, you know, sentiment engines. And I'm really intrigued with how remix culture gives us some pretty good tools to deconstruct that kind of thing. Um, but again, I personally think we're in the middle of an ongoing crisis of democracy and the rise of authoritarianism and ideologically very problematic issues around how, so like, for example, the war in Ukraine to me is, as an African-American, it's wild because it's like, okay, this is white people doing colonialism. Okay, got it. Like, it's like white on white colonialism. And the Russians, some of my favorite writers, uh, like, for example, Nikolai Vasilevich Gogol, his book, Dead Souls, he's Ukrainian, people tend to forget that, or um, Malevich, uh, who's infamous Black Square, which is a brilliant painting. It's also Ukrainian. But um, the, the hegemony of the Russian empire versus how people thought about the definition of whiteness, it's kind of fascinating because once, once Europeans come to America, they become white. And even how this is playing out with, say, for example, on, on the southern border, they're letting Ukrainians through and not Mexicans or this or that. I, I just think right now it's we're in an information uh, apocalypse. My motto these days is we're sort of in a nihilist comedy at the end of the world, so to speak. Um, but how, how these tools that we're kind of talking about with remixing is actually a beacon of hope uh, because we can say that multiple strategies exist, multiple worlds exist, multiple paths exist. Um, and I think that's a healthy symbol of our time because otherwise it's, it seems <laughs> really bleak. Um, so yeah, I'm just putting that out a there. But um, a, lot of, yeah. a lot of the critiques, so it's, it's interesting you bring up Hatsune Miku because uh, I was actually just talking about her with our mutual friend, Larissa Mann who was a uh, guest lecturing in my class this week. And Larissa told me something I didn't know about Hatsune Miku, which is that her um, lyrics are written by her fan base. So <clears throat> unlike a machine learning algorithm where, you know, uh, the algorithm itself uh, is fed like a, a huge database and it creates its own kind of inferences and connections between them, there's actually a much more conscious communitarian dimension towards the production of Miku's presentation, right? Like the, the fans actually kind of write the songs for her. So part of the reason she fills stadiums in Japan is because 
they're singing their she's singing their own lyrics back to them it's almost a form of like projected karaoke right but like collective projected karaoke holographic karaoke um so i think you know that's something that we don't like uh, those of us who study um ai and its role in society all we all kind of know this but we don't make it explicit often enough i think which is that each of these systems of machinic cultural generation is in some ways just a, a, a another kind of face on a collaborative cultural effort, which is of course how culture is always produced, right? Is through these kinds of society spanning dialogic processes. And, you know, that AI and uh, ML are not actually all that different than other forms of cultural processes that we've been engaging in since, you know, the dawn of human civilization. The only difference is that they're empirically much more monitorable by certain elements, right? Like a, a computer scientist with access to Toyota's proprietary code can look into Hatsune Miku and, and learn exactly how she takes, you know, this particular lyric from that fan and that particular lyric from the other fan. Um, and the same goes for GPT-2 or 3, right? You can reverse engineer all of this stuff. And there's actually, I just saw a really interesting project that reverse engineered the, um, the seed images that were fed into, uh, I think it was ImageNet, it was one of the major facial recognition technology algorithms. Just by looking at the output, they were able to reverse engineer the seed inputs, right? So transparency in these algorithms becomes a kind of uh, communal um, power sharing, like a redistributive act that uh, that takes the kind of obscurity of these algorithms, which is the part that scares us vis-a-vis -vis authenticity and the primacy of the human subjective experience and kind of defangs those fears by revealing the, the actual human strings that, uh, that are being encoded into, uh, into the algorithmic performances themselves. You're all nodding, which means I didn't make any sense, or I made a lot of sense. No, I mean I think you're I think you're you're making a heck of a lot of sense. And uh, I was thinking about it in relation to my engagement with GPT two as the co-author of my new book, and the and I, I noticed I said my relationship. It evolved over time, and uh, and the more that I looked into it, and the more that I looked at others who were looking into it, I found some interesting. Uh, co coherencies, let's call them. Uh, for example, there is a group called the uh, the in, uh, Indigenous uh, Protocol and AI Research Group. I'm not so sure if you all are familiar with them. And one of the things that I was picking up on on all those folks, and it's it's, it's an international group of Indigenous uh, artists, poets, engineers, designers, researchers, etc. Uh, they're they're looking at AI, some of them, anyways, as a uh, as kin, as another form of kin, and uh, as the, and, and potentially uh, as you know, so we think of like the keeper, like the keeper. So you know, if you think of the of the uh, of, of really the the traditions, right? So how do you you know the keeper of the tradition and how you pass those on throughout the ages? Well, how how are we going to be? Who's going to be the keeper of the data? Who's going? You know, where, what are the ledgers that are going to emerge in the future too? And so they're so they're looking at AI and also what we you know in the NFT uh, blockchain space is also called the metaverse, which is of course you're talking about the multiverse. We're also talking about the metaverse because that's obviously coming from Stevenson's novel. But you know, this it's it's amazing to me to see all of these things all of a sudden sort of just like pop up into the you know into the the pop cultural. Uh, dialogue now and then there's all all the folks who are the artists and also some in some cases the you know the scholars and the critical theorists who are all looking at this from so many different angles then what's what's coming of this like why why would this this uh indigenous protocol ai group look at ai and and the blockchain as places to uh to maintain the tradition right and and then and then if they and if those entities, those non-human entities, are in fact going to be keepers of the data, and keepers of the tradition, then you need to somehow come up with a uh, reciprocal relationship, right, relationship again, of respect 
and treat them as if they were kin. That's a really interesting approach to all this, I think. I'm not saying that that I'm totally on board with it all, but I'm just saying like I, I, I found that kind of interesting because of my relationship to right the language model as it evolved over the course of the writing of the book. So, so you know, from like a Martin Buber standpoint, did you was it an I thou relationship between you and GPT? Uh, it, I, an I thou relationship. I didn't think of it as an yeah. I'm always remixing the I, so I'm not quite sure who the I would be in this case or the thou. For me, it's more sort of like what Clarice Lispector calls the the R U A R E dash Y O U the R U relationship. So you in know. Fair, I, I, I want to just kind of jump in for just a second. I mean, amusingly enough, we always look for these paradigms that are just at the edge of what is already going on. And I love to look in the opposite direction, like in the history of things. And one of my favorite, there's a famous phase from probably like the Saudi minister of oil or something for Saudi Aramco, where he says uh, the Stone Age didn't end for lack of stone. And you know, it's, it's so funny. Is like uh, the whole NFTs, uh, uh, cryptocurrency, the social ledger, these are all still based on very specific routes of perception of market forces in a digital economy. And Aaron, what you were just talking about with the different sort of philosophical tools for being able to kind of question the idea of authenticity right now, blockchain is giving us kind of a folk narrative of that, um, that sort of deals with how we look at the arts. I mean, the other day I just read an article, a six-year-old kid just made several million dollars selling an NFT of like girls with long necks. And I was like, okay, but um, if you go back in time just a little bit, Milton Friedman did his uh, PhD on this, this island called Yap. And there was this uh, currency that they had called the Rai stones, R-A-I stones. And say, for example, Aram, if I wanted to buy like a cow from you and trade it to Mark for his book, um, we'd have to have like 20 guys carry one of these huge stones and leave it on your front porch. That would be the mark of the transaction. And then I would walk away with the, the book or you would get a cow. And then everybody knew because of the way the stone was put, uh, that we had made that transaction. But one day, one of the stones fell in the ocean near the island, and the guys didn't have the tools to be able to um, pull the stone up because these are huge, multi-ton uh, stones. Um, so they invented a way to just memorize and mnemonically reference the vanished stone. So amusingly enough, the whole village, and then that spread throughout the islands of this new virtual currency based on how many people remembered the transactions. And I love stuff like that because it really points to how ingenuous human beings are, even without the current digital technologies, without any of the issues that we're talking about, that humans have also had a social technology in place that allows us to rethink um, our relationships to both the, the, the digital objects around us in these virtual worlds, um, but from an indigenous and multicultural and also not globalized point of view that Europe is still, it's, it's in a tricky moment because the idea, the idea of the, the rational self is still a foundation of our economics. We're wildly irrational. Nobody talk to Putin. I mean, who do you think is rational these days? I mean, um, it's really a fascinating thing. I, I'm I'm fascinated with this idea of the post-rational as a way of as an escape hatch from the like the dead hand of the 20th century that's grappling grabbing our throats right now. Um, you know, my motto these days is let's put the future behind us. You know, kind of. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure which future that we need to move towards, but at the moment, the remix culture and other issues are good places to begin that critique of the linear and sort of the death march of uh, Western culture as it moves further into these kinds of um, dead spaces, all puns intended. Like, I don't know if you guys have seen Truth Social. That's uh, the app and uh, media organization that Trump has made. And it's all populated by bots asking for money to donate to, uh, it's like a ghost town of bots just asking for money <laughs> um, which is very Trump, um, perfect. But yeah, it's uh, these kind of uh, truth social. That, that could be the name of a uh, remix right there. But um, anyway, just, you're, you guys made me think about that a little bit, just from the viewpoint of uh, bots and algorithmic narrative. Just just riffing there. So it's really interesting because uh, I mean, I think talking about how things emerge, right? Like I was saying earlier, and I, I think all kinds of things uh, start to pop into my head and I think everybody else here the, the, the uh, uh, unrendered conscious <laughs> unrendered <laughs> unconscious. we could flip that I guess it's sort of uh, going back and forth but one of the reasons why I did not um, respond right away when uh, Aaron was speaking earlier um, is because it reminded me of certain things so in terms of this idea of sharing and, and also uh, Mark's uh, observations that as well just uh, pause 
just what he said now. And uh, in terms of, 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 you know, what all this implies, I mean, when, uh, when uh, uh, Aram specifically mentioned uh, lyrics being um, uh, written, uh, they're written by the fans, for example. It reminded me of works, uh, artworks like the Johnny Cash Project, which is this uh, video made, you know, for a Johnny Cash song where um, basically everybody gets to draw a frame at a time and people get to vote and which one will show up at the top of the, the video at, the, at any time. It's still on, I just looked for it. And then recently, and that's, you know, again, people contributing the content, right? It's almost like the ML is, is hum it's a bunch of humans doing this. And then the other one is um, uh, this uh, artist, uh, I was just uh, uh, pointed to this by one of my students, you know, uh, literally just yesterday, I was not aware of this work, it's Andrew Price, who's uh, developed an NFT project with a donut made of donuts, of thousands of CGI donuts. And, and basically he, he uh, invited other people to produce these donuts that create the donut. So when you see the 3D donut, you can look it up. I, I can send you the link. I was just looking there for was it. that collaborative drawing on Reddit a few weeks ago where you could only add one pixel every three hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah so, you know, there's so many examples. So I, I, I just wanted to find two examples because I can't just, because, you know, if we just say these things, we have to, you know, we're just academics. We have to like kind of support it. So I was looking for the two examples that this reminded me of. But you know, then the, the the question is, and I think anybody who's more pragmatic would say, well, the difference between an ML and like collective con contributions is that these are sentient beings, and the ML is just an algorithm, right? And then you know, I mean, we can get into that. But but in terms of a structural paradigm, it's they're functioning on a certain level that's the same, right? And so the question is. You know, what at one point, you know, uh, the algorithms are going to get um, closer and closer to sentient ability. And, and so I think the question we don't want to engage with in terms of creativity itself uh, will be we're going to have to face the music, so to speak, you know, and no pun intended. So everybody here has a relationship, very close relationship to music. Um, but, you know, I think that's a real question that's coming. And I think the sooner we engage with it, the better, you know. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna push back against that and say <clears throat> rather than getting closer and closer to machine sentience, <clears throat> I think the further development of machine al learning algorithms is going to push us further and further away from the concept of human sentience. Well, I agree. I, mean, I agree with that. I, I agree with that because it, you start to wonder what makes humans unique, right? Yeah, like our exceptionalism goes out the door. Which is, I think what you were trying getting. You were getting to it, the primacy question or paradigm you were introducing earlier. Yeah, I agree entirely. We have to write that article <laughs> just for the fun of doing it. I'm game. I'm game. So <laughs> we can get GPT three to help. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it may just blow your mind. Oh, actually, Jesse Gilbert and I wrote a section of our uh, forthcoming book, The Secret Life of Data, using GPT two. Um, probably oh, nothing I think, I think, I think, I think we, we, we touched base on that. That's right. Thanks for reminding oh, did me. Did we that. discuss that on Twitter? Yeah. Yeah, it was fun. I mean, we only wrote like, I don't know, 500 words with GPT-2. Nothing like the project that, that you've just finished. But yeah, it was an interesting experience, um, you know, kind of coaxing the algorithm into producing something legible. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that I talk about in the book, which I think I just thought I'd mention, I don't know what, what you said there that, that triggered this idea, but that's the whole point, you know, where does it come from, is that uh, I go back to a, a phrase by good old Ernest Hemingway, if we all remember him, uh, and you talked about a writer, like a writer really needing their own kind of like bulletproof internal bullshit detector, I'm paraphrasing him. And one of the things that I was discovering throughout the process of, uh, you know, collaboratively remixing and meta jamming with the GPT-2 is that, of course, it does not have its own bulletproof internal bullshit detector. Like if that has, you know, that algorithm that that has not been uh, uh, programmed into any AI yet, and so as a consequence, 
I had to become the GPT-2's editor. But the more that I became its editor, the more I be became the remixologist that I am. And so as a consequence, I started appreciating all the data outputs that it was giving me because it was further stimulating my own, not just my own thoughts, but my own praxis in real time, you know, as I was improvising with the source that it gave me. That's one of the, the fun things about live performance, as you know, is that, you know, you're working with the data in real time and you're not even sure what the outcomes will be, especially if you're working with a computer because you know the computer is liable to do anything at any given moment in time which creates this sort of like almost form of hyper improvisation but mark wouldn't you say that gans generative adversarial networks are by definition their own bullshit meters right i mean i'm not they're, yeah, they're trying they're, they're trying to be for sure yeah but the way that they yeah. work is that they try to game themselves it's like can i trick myself into thinking that yeah. this is an apple can i trick myself into thinking that this is a woman right like whatever the ont the ontological object is that they're supposed to be rendering uh semi-consciously um they the way that they do it is by is by seeing whether it's mass uh passes their own smell test yeah they have two basically they have a discriminator they, it's interesting because uh, it's um, discussed as a police officer and a criminal. So that tells you right there, it's a very binary uh, algorithm, which it, it ha it's a problem, perhaps, I don't know, something to discuss. But um, basically, you the, the discriminator has to catch the BS of the, uh, you know, the criminal. <laughs> and uh, when he passes, that's when you get a believable image. Um, but uh, uh, you know, obvious uh, the the, the Bell, Bellamy, you know, the Christie's uh, auction was produced that way, and uh, it, it it was left you know semi impressionistic like because of uh, the algorithm being you know uh, it looked it, it looked at images that that had that similar look. It just tries to mimic it, right? And so. You know, this person does not exist. It's been cited many times. I myself have cited it. Um, and those images look pretty realistic, but all it is is it, it, it learns through failure. It, it fails a lot to produce one thing, you know? So, you know, when Yoda says, you know, failure is the best, uh, best uh, you know, teacher. I mean, it's, it's kind of like computers are doing that to themselves. But yeah, it, it is, uh, you know, I, I, um, I think it's Goodfellow that wrote the, the algorithm, the initial algorithm, Ian Goodfellow. And uh, um, I read the paper because, you know, I had to write a little bit about this. And uh, it's really, I mean, it's really very binary. It's really oppositional. And that's one of the things that I wonder about the kind of algorithms that are being developed. They're really, um, uh, it's all, all about discrimination, right? Uh, this is an ethical, I mean, I wish David was here because he'd be able to talk about in terms of computational creativity, which he's uh, you know, extended uh, upon quite a bit at this point. So, but maybe next you time. Guys, so yeah, Eduardo and Aram, I, I wanna just riff for a second because there's there's something that um, Aram, what you reminded me of is like, how do we look at the role of how, what it means to be human online? And there's there's very famous incident, uh, which I'm sure you guys are all remember, Mark, especially this is very resonant with your book, where Microsoft made this chatbot called Tay and people started saying racist and sexist and twisted stuff to it on Twitter. And then the bot kept responding. And eventually they, they're called the racist chat bot. <laughs> and it's kind of like 16 hours. About that. Yeah. And so people kept posting in the, 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 the chat bot was trying to learn from the language and then respond to it in a way. So it started remixing people's phrases that were sent to it. And eventually it just started making this kind of like toxic sludge of posts. And so I, I mean, uh, that's kind of like where my motto these days is like Trump was like president as malware. So when you start to really think about the politics of these kind of technologies and the role of remixing and how sampling and collage unpack deep, deep structural powers in the human consciousness about memory, identity, authenticity. And then Mark, once you start thinking about the GP3 approach, uh, GPT-3 approach. Um, there's a lot to be said for how we think about composition overall. And one of my favorite mathematicians, again, slightly controversial, is uh, Stephen Wolfram. And Wolf, uh, Stephen Wolfram made this series of large-scale data sets of music called Wolfram Alpha, which is about math and music. And you can style, have any style of music, hip-hop, techno, dubstep, just put in your taste parameters and it starts to generate all sorts of... So that's been a new sort of holy grail. But let's let's do a reverse Turing test here, or a remix of the Turing test, where you can really think about what it means to be human by questioning the question of being human. So, I mean, it's kind of, when Turing came up with this idea of the Turing test, 
it seems to be like it become a holy grail about like determining the humanity uh, as an illusion of the chat bot or this or that kind of thing. But um, there's, there's a lot of other kinds of paradoxes like prisoner's dilemma, for example, where you're offered um, a situation where if you betray or, or uh, rat out the person you win or lose and so on. But it's kind of the same way with social media. It's not really um, about winning or losing, but gaining again, the, the attention graph. Um, and that's how most of these, in, these platforms keep you engaged. Whereas TikTok, for example, is uh, based on what you call kind of a, like, I would say the difference between a TikTok approach versus a Western social media approach is the tension between the attention graph versus the social graph. But so too with music and collage and film and like how these things pull you in and then keep you engaged. If you feed people enough of a familiar, but yet different uh, and slightly intangible differences that keeps them engaged with the medium. Um, and these, all these different platforms have learned how to monetize and optimize themselves for that. Um, uh, probably one of the most engaging is YouTube, obviously, or TikTok. Those are both visual based and the recommendation engines. There's been experiments where if you put in a right wing meme into YouTube, it'll start recommending you like a guy, a writer, if I remember correctly, from either Wired or The New Yorker put in, they were like a, a slightly right wing mom on Facebook just as an experiment and immediately started getting all these sort of algorithmic narratives and bots uh, recommending Trump and recommend. <laughs> um, and it just got deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole. And, but then you realize you see right wing lunatics like arguing with a chat bot on Twitter or something, and they don't even know it's not a person. Um, so these are all just things that are uh, grist for thought. And I have to check out just in a moment. So I did want to say, I really, this has been a very life affirming and heartwarming conversation. It's a pleasure to see everybody. I have to check out in about two minutes because I have another thing coming up. But um, is there any like, uh, well, protocol? So, yeah. 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 Oh, no, I, I really enjoyed the conversation. I, I've been wanting to get together with this crew for a long time. So I want to thank Vanessa for, for making it real. This is great. We were yeah, rendering, thank you so uh, much. rendering the unconscious uh, collaboratively <laughs> and generatively. <laughs> we are uh, for never... being here. Yeah, and you just step back. You just kind of let let it all out, let us just go at it. So um, that's what I, I, I like, like to do. In and ask a couple of questions as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you all for okay, being here. We'll do it again. Scratching the surface. Yeah. We'll have to do it again. <laughs> you know what? Okay. I'd love to put this out there as a hypothetical. Why don't we do this as a public forum one of these days? Um, like the art of the remix or the art of, um, you know, GPT uh, technologies and remix culture or something and just do a big public open thing. I mean, I've been doing a lot of dialogues tomorrow. If you guys have a moment, I'm doing a dialogue with uh, Timothy Schneider. He's one of the world's leading historians of tyranny, which, um, you know, that's, that's, that's going to be a Yale. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's no, his, a bleak his topic. His book is must read. Yeah. It's very short. Yeah. It's, yeah. And we're going to be at Yale tomorrow. And then um, there, actually, Aram, you might be into this. Nikki Giovanni, she's a legendary sort of revolutionary poet. Sure. We're doing a dialogue for Earth Day about um, the linguistic framing of the climate crisis. Um, and her poetry Ooh. is, yeah, Send we're doing that tomorrow. I have a doctor who would love that. Okay, yeah. But yeah, let's do this stuff in public. I mean, I think people are, are hungry for this kind of dialogue. And I think if we did it in a public format, it'd be kind of fun and just, we, I, I think love we're different. hungry for it too. We we need we need to talk, you know. I, I mean, we could have these sort of coffee or drinks. I mean, I, you know, this is being recorded, so I don't know what that sounds like. But, <laughs> but you know, I mean, uh, you know, uh, coffee and or, or you know, uh, beer is. I'm uh, glad to host it at you once I'm back from my sabbatical in the fall. Um, yeah. yeah, maybe maybe let's think about something next spring. Sounds great. Yeah, great. Cool. And. Um, Vanessa, thank you for convening this. This is really refreshing. Thank yeah, you, guys. It's great. It's been really great. Thank you for making this possible. So. Thank you for listening to Rendering Unconscious. You've just heard a discussion about Remix and the post-rational future with Mark America, David Gunkel, Paul D. Miller, Eduardo Navas, and Aram Sinreich. 
Visit the text accompanying this episode or the main website for links to all of their websites and social media. That's renderingunconscious.org. You can also visit my website for links, drvanessasinclair.net. And now the track, These Boots, just got a brand new pair from the album Conceive Ourselves, a collaboration I did with Pete Murphy, available at Bandcamp. Just visit Highbrow Low Life's Bandcamp page. That's highbrowlowlife.bandcamp.com. Enjoy. These boots are made for walking. Just got a brand new pair. These boots are made for walking. Just got a brand new pair. These boots are made for walking. Just got a brand new pair. These boots are made for walking. Just got a brand new pair. However, one of these days, these boots will drug the psyche of us all. Drug the psyche of us all. Drug the psyche of us all. These boots are made for walking. Just got a brand new pair. These boots are made for walking. Just got a brand new pair. These boots are made for walking. Just got a brand new pair. These boots are made for walking. Just got a brand new pair. However, one of these days, these boots will drug. You. One of these days, these boots will drug. You. One of these days, these boots will drug. You. One of these days, these boots will drug. You. Drug. You. Drug. You.